Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. All times, both now and ever, and under the ages of ages. Amen. The prayer we're going to share this evening is a prayer of St. Ephraim the Syrian, who's called the Liar, the Harp of the Holy Spirit. And it's a prayer in preparation for the reading and the study of Holy Scripture. O Master who love mankind, Illumine our hearts with the pure light of thy divine knowledge and open the eyes of our mind to understand the teachings of thy holy scriptures. Instill in us also the fear of thy blessed commandments that we may overcome all carnal desires entering upon a spiritual life and understanding and acting in all things according to thy holy will. For thou art the enlightenment of our souls and bodies, O Christ our God, and to thee we render glory together with thy Father and thine all-holy, gracious, and life-giving Spirit, both now and ever, and unto ages of ages. Amen. Amen. St. Ephraim, pray for pray us. Christ. Thank you, Father Joseph. We have a handout. Oh, thank you, Melanie, for our handout. Does everybody have the handout? We're going to talk about the map, maybe. The other part of the outline of your Bible is just kind of a helpful hint for you. I recommend taking this to your copy machine, sizing it down, opening up your Bible, and taping it to your back page of your Bible like I did. Because it's a very helpful, helpful list of texts. You'll see that you have, this was prepared by my brother a number of years back. And you'll see the general, the basic timeline up there at the top, the next row down. You have the time periods, what was going on. You see that? Early history, patriarchs, and so forth. The next line down, you have your major people. The next line down, you have your major narrative books that were written, the historical books. If you read those books of the Bible, you're going to get the historical narrative of your entire Bible. And then dropping underneath those, you will see texts which are associated with historical texts. So you want to dive a little deeper in and get some details, you're going to go to these other works. And then you'll see also the prophets there, the prophets that went to Israel and the prophets that went to Judah. These are all prophets who wrote texts that we have. Obviously, there are other prophets in the scriptures, but these are the ones that wrote texts that we have. Does that all kind of make sense? That's a really helpful thing my brother put together. I recommend that you hold on to that. It's a little prize there. First of all, what are we doing here over the next three weeks? I am very excited to have three weeks together. Okay, and I want to recommend to you and suggest to you that to make a commitment. I realize that it's hard to say what you're going to be doing next Sunday and the Sunday after that. But there was a, a lady that walked in this evening and she held her Bible in her hand. She looked at me and she said, Deacon Sabatino, I don't even know what to do with this. We've got a problem. And it's a problem I hope we're going to take a first step in solving over the next few weeks. And that is basic Bible literacy. How do we open up our Bible and find our way through it? And if you say, I already know how to do that, I'm still going to suggest you do it. I know how to do it. I do for the most part. I don't know everything. There's many things I need to learn. But let me tell you that I do what we are going to be doing over the next three weeks. I do on a weekly basis in my head. I do it on a weekly basis and sometimes more often than that with my children. Where we start with Adam and we walk to Jesus Christ by memory. Knowing every major event and every major person, and how they're related one to the other. You say, I don't think I could pull that off. Well, my six-year-old daughter can, and my four-year-old son can, and I think pretty soon my two-year-old son will be able to. Okay? Why? Because that's what we do in our house. That's what we do on the way to church. 
I only say that to you because I myself have to do it on a regular basis. This is one of my favorite programs that we do at the Institute of Catholic Culture. I like to do it every single year. We skipped last year. But simply to refresh ourselves, to open our, our Bibles and do this again until it becomes so easy for us that you can be asked any person in the Bible and you're going to know exactly where they fit into the story. Because these are are our ancestors. These are the great men and women that came before us that have handed on the faith to us. It's absolutely essential that we come to know who these people are so that we can come to know who we are and that our faith is founded upon a solid foundation, not built upon sand. So what are we going to be doing? We're going to be walking from page one to the end over the next three weeks. We're going to cover the entire Bible. We're going to put it all in order. We're going to know all of those major figures. And if you say to me, I don't know the major figures, you're going to know the major figures. You're going to be able to tell me how Noah is related to Adam and how Noah is related to King David and how King David is related to Jesus Christ and so forth. So that by the time we walk out of here in three weeks, if you make that commitment with me, you're going to be able to tell your neighbor every major person and every major event, and how they're related one to another from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation. Do you believe me? Oh, you probably don't believe me. <laughs> so, we're going to start slow. One of the requests I had was, Deacon Sabatino, last time I did this with you, you went too fast. We've got to go fast if we're going to cover the whole Bible. How many of you don't have your Bible on you tonight? Okay, you got to bring your Bible with you. You got to bring your Bible with you over the next few weeks. First of all, just open up with me. We're going to do a real quick exercise, and we're just going to flip through our Bible real fast. And you say, I already know all this. That's okay. We got to do it. I do too, but I need to do it to help myself remember. The first five books of the Old Testament are called the Pentateuch. The Pentateuch. And you'll see Genesis. Just flip with me. Okay, humor me. Genesis. What comes next? Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua. I see you didn't want to say Joshua. You didn't know what came next, did you? Joshua. You know what the story of Joshua, when they come back into the Holy Land after the Exodus, so you know where you are in the, in the story. Judges. You all know Samson, don't you? This is where Samson's written about, okay? In Judges. You have 1st and 2nd Samuel and 1st and 2nd Kings. You're with me? And 1st and 2nd Chronicles. These six books are the story of the kings. You all know about King David. You've heard of King David and Solomon. That's where they're written about. We're going to make all that make sense and how they're related to each other. And then right after 1st and 2nd Chronicles, we have the Babylonian exile not one of your books, but it happened. And then you have Ezra and Nehemiah. And then you get into the wisdom literature and you're going to find as you're flipping through there, Proverbs and you're going to find Psalms. You see, everybody finds Psalms. So we saw, we said the, the Pentateuch or the story of the patriarchs. Then we have the historical books of the Bible. Then we have the wisdom literature. And following the wisdom literature... We have what? The prophets. And those prophets then will take you, I know I'm being a little loose here, all the way up to the New Testament. And the prophets are laid out in your Bible from longest to shortest. For the most part. If there is two texts related to each other, they'll put those together. And so you'll see the prophet Jeremiah, which is one of the longer prophecies, and right after the prophet Jeremiah is the book of Lamentations. Lamentations of Jeremiah. Lamentations are very short. But they tack it right there next to Jeremiah. So you can find your prophets longest to shortest, for the most part. And then your Bibles, some of your Bibles will conclude with First and Second Maccabees. Some of your Bibles will put First and Second Maccabees back there with the historical books. If you're looking at a New American, most likely yours did that. All right? Are you with me or am I losing you already? And then you're into the New Testament. 
and you've got your New Testament, and following the Gospels and Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you have Acts of the Apostles. Flip there. Everybody's together with me. And following Acts of the Apostles, you have the Epistles of St. Paul. And again, the Epistles of St. Paul, for the most part, are written longest to shortest. But first, all of the communities that St. Paul wrote to. Once you turn from Acts, you're going to turn to all the epistles that were written to communities, like the Corinthians and the Ephesians and so forth, and then all of the epistles written to people, like Timothy and so forth, okay? And then you have, finally, what we call the Catholic epistles. Not because the Protestants don't have them, but because they are epistles written to the universal church, meaning not to a particular community. And so you have the epistles of Peter and of James and of Jude and and so forth. And then finally, the book of Revelation. You're with me? All right. I hope that was a little bit helpful because as we're turning, I'm going to be able to say to you, Corinthians, and you're going to now be able to go right there because you know it follows Acts and it is written to a community, right? And so it's right within those texts. I don't know which one comes first and second. You'll be able to find it by flipping. And similarly, as we're going through the Old Testament, we're going to be turning our Bibles a lot together. Don't get frustrated. Be challenged, but not frustrated. I would recommend, and if you start to get frustrated, if you start to get frustrated just now with me a little bit, like I couldn't move fast enough, very simple. Go home and do what I just did with you. And do it two and three times. And guess what? You solved your problem. And you can do that now over the next few weeks, familiarizing yourself with all of these texts. If you want, you can memorize them all in order. That would be helpful. Okay, I want to give you a couple of tools here at the beginning. As you're reading your Bible, please do not be so pietistic that you think you cannot write in your Bible. I love piety and holiness, but let me tell you, the Word of God is written for our salvation. If it never gets off the page and into our soul, we've got a problem. And so it's my opinion that whatever it takes to get it off the page and into your heart, you got to do it. We don't call ourselves a people of the book. We are a people of the living Word of God. And unless this book gets off of this page and into you and starts living, and the living Word of God becomes incarnate in our hearts, then guess what? This book might as well not have been written. It's the Word of God. It's meant to take life and be enfleshed and be lived out now. And so I recommend to you, go down to um, Staples or one of these places and pick up a few highlighters. I like these ones, the Sharpie accent. They don't bleed through the paper. They're not too dark, so you can see through it still. You can get orange, green, pink, yellow, blue, and purple. And then you can start using them according to themes. For example, if you found something that had to do with God giving his life to us, what color would you use? Fine. No, no, that's good. I would use green. But if yellow makes sense to you, then use yellow. I have a little code in the front of my Bible, which I follow somewhat. I use orange for covenant. Why? I don't know. But I started that way. I use purple for, thank you, royalty. Whenever the kingdom of God is mentioned. I have a little ruler and I have a pen. One of those pens that has four different colors in it. You go click green, blue, red, and black, right? If I see connections between two parts in a text, I'll draw a line so that I can open up my Bible and immediately I can see a connection between two points. I'm making connections between words so I can look at Watch how fast this happens. Good and evil. I'm following my green line right up. Like God knowing good and evil, two pages apart. Hmm? It's a theme, and I can watch that theme, and I can connect it sometimes three and four different places, and suddenly it helps me to be studying the text and making those connections, okay? Whatever it takes to help you, do it. Do it. All right. Any questions about that? Finally, a little tool. I brought my big tool. This is called a concordance. It's a word concordance. I can look up the word baptism and it's going to give me every single time that word is used. Or Abraham, every time that word is used. Or a location, 
every time that word is used, you know, a Jerusalem. And so I can start to find other places in the Bible where these themes are appearing, and I can start to make connections that way. They make a nice as a Strong's Concordance. It's a Protestant concordance, but I'll tell you what, the Catholics haven't written one nearly as nice as this. Don't buy the latest version of this. Buy last year's version, you get a lot cheaper, and guess what? The Bible didn't change. They just changed the cover. But I recommend for you to get the small version. I've got a little tiny one that I carry around with me all the time. And your last tool is a map. You've got to have some maps. So go down and get yourself an atlas. Now, I picked up this little atlas of the Bible lands back when I was in college. It was four times the size of this. I went down to the printer. I said, shrink it for me to these dimensions. They shrunk it. I can now place it in my Bible cover. And I've got an atlas with me wherever I go. And I was using this on the airplane. I was talking to this. I love airplanes and Bibles. I sat down. Sure enough, God put me next to a Jew. And (laughs) we had the greatest discussion. And he was, it was consulting his, his Hebrew text, and I was asking all sorts of questions that I wanted to share with you today, and we were back and forth like that. So those are some little tools that you can use. If you want to be serious, you got to get serious. I'm tired of people saying, but what version of the Bible should I use? Right? You have that question, don't you? Be, admit it. You have that question. Read whatever version you have, because at least you're reading something, Right? Don't hide behind the fact that you don't have the right version. Now, there are better versions than others, but at least pull it out for the love of God and dust it off and start reading. And once you start reading, then worry about making sure you get the right translation once you know you're really serious about what you're doing. So those are a few pointers and a few tools that I hope you can take home with you and make use of so that you can read and you don't, and read with profit. This is your book that you can open it on your own and not get lost. And that's exactly what we're going to solve over the next three weeks together. That you can walk through the Bible and not get lost. Okay? Now, Adam and Eve. How many of you recognize those names? (laughs) Raise your hand. Humor me. Noah. Abraham. The Babylonian exile. Be honest. Ah, see, we see a little bit shaky, don't we? How about this? Jesus. <laughs> now, how many of you know the name of the third son of Adam? A few of you who have done a Bible study with me before. Let me tell you that if you can't tell me who the third son of Adam was you will not know who Noah was. He'll be a person, but you won't know really who he was because you won't know who his fathers were, who his sons are, and so forth. How many of you know who Enoch was? Mm, Not too good. If you don't know who Enoch was, again, you're not going to have a clue who Noah is. Enoch was the, what, great-great-grandfather of Noah. We're going to look at that. How many of you know where Mount Moriah was, historically? Not too good. If you don't know where Mount Moriah was, then you do not know the story of Abraham's sacrifice of his son Isaac. You thought you did, but you don't. How many of you know who Jeroboam was? Jeroboam. If you don't know who Jeroboam was, you won't know why there was a Babylonian exile. When the Pharisees went to the Jordan River and they said to John the Baptist, Are you the prophet? What did he say? He said, No. Who was the prophet? Hmm. What was their next question? Are you Elijah? Ah, so the prophet wasn't Elijah, was it? No. If you don't know who the prophet among the Jews was, 
And the Pharisees are coming down to identify who the Messiah was. And their question is, are you the prophet? Trying to find the Messiah. Guess what? You're not going to know who Jesus Christ is from a Jewish perspective. Do you see the problem? What we as Catholics, and there's something good about our situation. It's this. We, first of all, we're like browbeaten children. Now, for our Protestants that are with us, look, you're wrong. <laughs> Catholics know their Bible. They just don't know it like you know it. We know it in two different ways. Catholics know the stories of the Bible. You know virtually every story of the Bible. You just don't have a clue on how those stories are related one to the other. We know all of the major events, but we don't know the bridge stories, the stories which connect those events one to the other. We couldn't tell you how the flood is related to the sacrifice of Isaac or how the sacrifice of Isaac is related to Joseph. Huh? You know the story of Joseph, right? And his robe of many colors and so on. Yeah, of course. But what's the context of that story? What's the story that comes just before it and just after it? What's the narrative? So over the next few weeks, we're going to be building those bridges together. Building those bridges so you can connect the flood with the story of Joseph. And the story of Joseph with King David. And King David with the Babylonian exile. And the Babylonian exile with Ezra. And Ezra with Jeremiah. And Jeremiah with the Maccabees. And the Maccabees with St. Paul. So that you can see the whole framework. You can see the beautiful tapestry that has been built. The Bible is a collection of many books. 73 books in your Catholic Bible. Written by many different people. In our last series, we talked about how that inspiration takes place so that God inspires the author while using the person's talents and gifts and way of life. So that every book of the Bible has the fingerprint of its author. You can literally see the author when you're reading their book. That's nice, but it's also difficult because every author writes differently, doesn't he? And so from book to book, we're going to find that there's different forms, different styles of writing. But underneath those 73 books, underneath all of those human authors, is the one author, God who weaves a wonderful tale of salvation from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation so that you can read, and if you read with the right eyes, and you can see through the hands of the human author to the hand of the divine author, you will be able to see the story of salvation stretch across thousands of years, 73 different books, many different authors. One story. The story of salvation history. That's going to be our goal. What do we normally do? We open our Bible. We start reading it. When do we start reading our Bible? January 1st, right? Oh, I'm going to make this year different. I'm not going to eat too much, and I'm going to start reading the Bible. How many of us have started reading the Bible in Genesis chapter 1 on January 1st? What about at the beginning of Lent? We start reading And what happens? You get to Leviticus and you want to jump off the Empire State Building. You close your Bible and you put it away, don't you? What other things do you hit? What things cause problems for us? The begats. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Yeah, the begats are a disaster. And guess what? They're right there in chapter 4 of the book of Genesis. If you made it to Leviticus, you're a pretty hardcore Most people don't make it out of Genesis. Most people get to chapter 4 and they say, that's ridiculous. I can't deal with this. And they go back to the New York Times. God forbid. So, what are we going to do? First of all, to realize that everything in the Bible matters. Do you think if you believed that God had chosen your people out of the entire human race to save the world. Do you think 
in your book where you tell that story, you would put things that don't matter? No. Everything in the Bible matters. And usually the things which we think are the least important are the most important. And so we get to the begats and we skip them, don't we? We close our Bible or we skip them. Well, let me tell you right now that if you skip them, you're going to be lost. If you skip the book of Leviticus in the sense that you just say, I don't care. I'm going to tell you a little bit that you shouldn't care so much about the book of Leviticus later on, but in its proper context. We have to understand why these things are there. And only when we start to understand why they're there will we be able to make use of why they're there for our salvation. Now, we're going to start in Genesis chapter 1, but I just want to paint a quick little picture for you. In the first few chapters of Genesis, God plants a garden. And in the midst of that garden, he plants the tree of life and the tree of knowledge. If Adam and Eve were to eat from the tree of life, what would happen? They would live forever. And flowing through the midst of that garden was a river, which we call the river of life, which fed the garden and flowed out to water the whole world. And there in that garden, man was to come and to eat from the tree of life and to live forever. Now I want you to turn from the book of Genesis to the book of Revelation. To the last chapter of the book of Revelation. Chapter 22. Actually, we'll go to chapter 21 and then chapter 22. Chapter 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven... And a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. What do you think a new heaven and a new earth is going to look like? Look at chapter 22, verse 1. Then he showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb, through the middle of the streets of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life. Huh? The Garden of Eden in the book of Revelation. The entire Bible is the story of God's home and our journey back to that home. Our exile, oftentimes, through sin from that place of God's life, from that place of salvation, and then God's calling mankind back to paradise to give us, again, access to to eternal life. The whole Bible is the story of that journey. And if you keep that journey in the forefront of your mind, you will not get lost when you're reading the sacred scriptures. Everything is about that journey. Every story, every relationship, every conversation has to do with that one topic that God has made a home among men. And he wants us to dwell there with him. And when man sins, he places himself outside of the house of God. And when man lives the life of virtue, of grace, he finds himself back in the home of God. Everything we talk about over the next three weeks will be about that journey. All right, now turn back to the book of Genesis. We are going to be flying I'm going to be talking fast. You're going to be writing notes. Stop me if I lose you. Stop me if you have a question. This is going to be a much more of a practicum than we're used to. I'm not going to simply be lecturing at you. If you have questions, if you start to get lost, put up your hand. Wait a minute. What are you talking about? Say it again. And we'll get through it together. I will hold your hand and you will hold mine. And together we'll hold the hand of Jesus. Okay? And we won't get lost. And we hopefully won't get frustrated. And we'll find our way from the Garden of Eden back to the Garden of Eden. Amen? Amen. Okay. I need to point out a few themes. We are not going to be stopping in the stories you already know. How many of you know the story of Adam and Eve? Thank you. We don't have to talk about it. 
If you get to a point where I say we're skipping this story and you say, wait a minute, Deacon Sabatino, I don't know that story, then write it down in your notepad and that's your homework. Very simple. We don't need to cover too much about Genesis chapters 1, 2, and 3, except you need some basic themes. Because if the story is about paradise, then we better have our basic themes down to be able to recognize when God's calling us back. So that when we walk back into his home, we can recognize our home again. We know what it's supposed to look like. We know what it doesn't look like. And so I want to give you a few themes. First of all, in Genesis chapter 1, There are how many days in creation? And on the sixth day, God created. If you're writing it down, it's verse 26. And man is made in thee. The image and likeness of God. And man is told to have dominion over creation. What kind of a person has dominion over creation? A king. Adam's job in paradise was to set society in order. To place each part of society in its, re- in its place where it was supposed to be. So all of the garden could function properly and together could become fruitful and multiply and become beautiful and flower and become what God had wanted it to become. I need you to grab some points that are very important to be able to put in our bag for our journey. And the first thing you got to realize is that man is made to be a king in creation. He's made to be a king in as a reflection of, in the image and likeness of the king of all, of God who set creation in order in the beginning. And notice what we see in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. And God blessed them. This blessing is fundamentally important for our story because we will see many blessings along the way. This is the patriarchal or fatherly blessing by which he bestows upon his son that which was his. God is the king of creation. And now he makes man to image him, to be like him, to be a king of creation. And here with this blessing of Adam and Eve, He raises them up to stand in his shoes, to be the head of the family of God. We are going to see that blessing continue on now, and we're going to follow that blessing from Adam to Jesus Christ. On the seventh day, God blessed his creation. And in the Hebrew, the word for seven has a common root. It shares a common root word, with the word for covenant or oath. Why is this important? Because oftentimes, things are done according to the number seven, or in a seven repetition, or in the pattern of seven, like seven days, to symbolize something more than simply seven days. God creates in seven days to tell his creation that he desires to have a covenant with them. What is a covenant? What happens in a covenant? Two parties, they become one with each other. Today we call a contract. In a contract, I sign on a piece of paper, the other person signs on the piece of paper, and we promise to be in agreement about that point. We promise to be one. A covenant is even more of a deep contract by which two come into a relationship with each other to share a common life. God created in the beginning in order to form us into a union with Him. He created within a seven-day structure. I said in the earlier that in that garden, he planted two trees. You'll see that in Genesis chapter 2, verse 9. Out of the ground, the Lord God made to grow every tree that was pleasant to sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And if they ate from the tree of life, they would... And if they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, they would? They would surely die. 
when we speak of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, this is called a Hebrew mirrorism, where it's a, a literary way of expressing the fullness or the full extent of a thing, from good to evil, all knowledge. The fathers tell us that Adam and Eve were meant to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but only in obedience at the right time, once God prepared them for it. He said, don't eat yet. Just like I tell my children, don't touch the oven. The cookies in there are for you. And someday I'm going to be able to show you how to open the oven and get them out if I do my job right. But not yet. And Adam and Eve, as you know, were disobedient. And they received, instead of life, death. Notice that in Genesis chapter 2, when God says that they're not to eat from the tree of knowledge, He doesn't say, on the day that you eat of it, I will kill you. He says, you will surely die. You will place yourself outside of a relationship with me. And only in relationship with God do we live forever. God does not condemn us to death. We condemn ourselves to death. Just like if we decided to turn off the lights in this room, there would be no more light. There would be a lack of light. And so similarly, if Adam and Eve decide, and we and all of the men we're going to meet decide to walk away from God, then guess what we're going to have? We're going to have death as the consequence of man's choice, not as the condemnation of God. God desires us to live. Does that make sense? Absolutely fundamental as we move forward and we see people dying in sacred scripture. We do. We see a lot of people dying. We see a lot of war and death. We're going to have to deal with that. And we have to always put it at the forefront of our mind that God stands knocking at the door. But when we decide to close the door, the lights turn off. Not because God desires it to be that way. Okay. I've got, you know, I know I've got like eight themes here. I mean, you've got to know about image and likeness. You need to know about the seven-day structure. You need to know about the tree of life and the tree of knowledge. You've got to know about life and death, blessing and curse. When Adam and Eve sinned, and they ate from the tree of knowledge. God walked into the garden. And what did Adam do? Yeah, look at verse 8 of chapter 3. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from God. They closed the door. They hid themselves from God. We will have this theme throughout Scripture of those who walk with God and those who do not. When you walk with God, you receive life. When you walk away from God, when you hide from Him, you receive death. Also, in the beginning, Adam and Eve were made, and the Scriptures tell us, naked and unashamed. The fathers of the church, though, say, but they were clothed in the grace of God, so that though they were naked, as we commonly think about clothing, They were robed in glory so that when Adam and Eve freely chose to walk away from their father, to take off that robe of glory, then and only then did they realize that they were naked and they were ashamed of their nakedness because now man was found without grace, without that important element by which God had made him as his image and likeness. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, we get the beginning of what will take thousands of years to solve. What we call the Proto-Evangelium, the first good news. Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed, speaking to the serpent, He shall crush your head, and you shall crush his heel. To the woman he said, I will greatly multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children, and so forth. 
right here at the beginning, just as the fall takes place, we get the first good news that one day, through the seed of the woman, God will bring about the destruction of the devil. Right here at the beginning, we get the news, not only that there will be a good ending, but that before that good ending is brought about, there will be a battle. A battle between humanity, the seed of the woman, and the serpent who is striking. There will be a fight. And where there is a fight and a battle, there will be blood and there will be death. I bring this up now because as we stand here in 2012, I think we become so sensitized to this whole thing. We need to realize that God desires us to live. And when man puts himself on the side of the devil, then what will be revealed in man's life is what is truly going on in his life, namely death. As one priest I know says, there are many more people today who are lying peacefully in the tomb and yet are alive in God than there are living people walking on this earth who are actually dead. Life is about more than standing here on earth. Life is about being alive in our soul. And so oftentimes when death occurs in the soul, that death will be revealed in physical form. So we say, oh, that's so mean of God to let that happen. God is simply letting happen what he has been trying to stop. He is merely revealing to us what has already taken place. That when we find men dying in the battles of war, as they take the side of the enemies of God, what is being manifest and revealed is merely the end result of what has already happened in their heart. All through salvation history, then, we will see this battle played out. A battle between God, who is relentless in desiring our life, who will not stop until he saves man. And we will see the devil taking man for himself and placing man in the midst of that battle, and death results, and blood is poured out. And God will not stop battling for man until he wins at the moment of the resurrection. That battle now will be the story of salvation history. If you ever thought the Bible was boring, put on your seatbelts. Because let me tell you, it is the greatest story of the battle that has ever taken place on this earth. It is a battle for humanity, and God will not lose. He will not lose. And the harder the devil fights, the more blood will be spilt upon this earth until God finally crushes the head of the serpent through the power of the mother of God. That is the story that we are going to witness now from Genesis all the way to the New Testament. We cannot lose sight of that. Realize that as we're going, oftentimes the Bible is written like we're not used to being written. It's not written like the New York Times. And so language is oftentimes highly symbolic, just like the number seven is. Just like I was saying, the number seven can be a representation of something bigger than the number seven. Similarly, as the gentleman was pointing out, the Psalms say that for God, a day is like a thousand years. A thousand years in Scripture is a highly symbolic term. It means a whole long time. That's what it means to us. A thousand years is a long time. It's highly symbolic. And if we go and apply modern New York Times reading to the sacred Scriptures, we're going to run into all sorts of crazy interpretations. Don't let that happen. We're going to try as best we can, to realize where those basic symbols are so that we can apply them. Now, you know the story about Eve. We don't have to talk about that. You know the story of Cain and Abel, don't you? 
You don't have to talk about that. But you do know that Cain offered to God something that was rejected. And what did he do in Genesis chapter 4? He killed his brother Abel. Was Abel a just man? Yes, he was a just man. And so we get here at the beginning of the story of salvation history, where God is going to crush the power of the devil. We get two figures, Cain and Abel. There's an immediate split between the good and the bad. Those who are going to follow God and those who are not. And those who are going to follow God are going to live a life of virtue. And those that are going to follow the devil are going to try to kill the sons of God. And Cain slew his brother Abel. In Genesis chapter 4, right after that happens, in verse 17, read with me, verse 17, Cain knew his wife, and she conceived and bore Enoch. This is not the Enoch we want to be paying attention to. And he built a city and called the name of the city after the name of his son. Pay attention to that. He called the name of the city after the name of his son. Hold on to that. To Enoch was born Irad, and Irad was the father of Mehushael, and Mehushael was the father of Methushael, and Methushael was the father of Lamech, and so forth. This is where we close our Bibles, don't we? Okay. If we read carefully and we count the generations from Adam down the line of the genealogy of Cain, we come to the man Lamech in verse 19. And Lamech took two wives. Not good. That's bad. Okay, First sign that we've got a major problem on our hands. Verse 23, And Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, Hear my voice, you wives of Lamech. Hearken to what I say. I have slain a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. So he's killed another person. The great, 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 great grandson of Cain has killed another person. I have slain a man for wounding me, a young man for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, Lamech is avenged seventy-sevenfold. Hmm? Lamech has killed somebody And far from asking God for forgiveness, he is rejoicing in his place. He is rejoicing in death. And if you count the generations from Adam through Cain to Lamech, guess how many generations there are? Seven generations. Complete covenant union with the devil. Genealogies are important. Verse 25, And Adam knew his wife again, and she bore a son and called his name Seth. For she said, God has appointed to me another child instead of Abel, for Cain slew him. Who's the third son of Adam? Seth. Seth replaces Abel. Was Abel a just man? Absolutely. And so we will now follow the genealogy of Seth to find out What kind of a relationship is going to develop among this line of righteous men? Notice the first thing we're told in verse 26. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, men began to call upon the name of the Lord. Look back at verse 17. Cain knew his wife and she bore a son Enoch. Not Enosh, Enoch. He built a city and he called the name of the city after God, after his son, making a name for himself. And this is what I was talking to about that Jewish man in the airplane. The word there in the Hebrew called the name, the Hebrew word is Shem. We're going to meet a man with that name very soon in the story. Cain knew his wife, verse 17, and she conceived and bore Enoch. And he built a city, and he called the Shem of the city, the name of the city, after the name of his son, making a name for himself upon the earth. Now look at verse 26. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time men began to call upon 
the name of the Lord, the Shem of the Lord. Notice the difference. One group is trying to gain power for themselves, to take what is not theirs to take. Who does that sound like? Adam and Eve. To take what is not theirs to take. The other group is glorifying God and making God wonderful upon the earth. And if we now read in chapter 5, this is the book of the generations of Adam. When God created man, He made him in the image and likeness of God. Male and female He created them. And he blessed them and named them man when, he, when they were created. When Adam lived 130 years, he became the father of a son in his likeness. After his image and named him Seth. The days of Adam after he became a father of Seth were 800 years and he had sons and daughters. Thus all the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. When Seth had lived 105 years, he became the father of Enosh. Seth lived and blah, blah, blah. Now we close our Bibles again, don't we? Because we have another genealogy. But I hope you know that by now you better not skip that genealogy because it's going to tell you something very important about these people. We're going to follow the genealogy of the people of Seth. The family of God. And if you count seven generations from Adam down through Seth and follow his line, and just scan with me. Chapter 5, verse 6, we have Seth. Verse 9, Enosh. Verse 12, Kenan. Verse 15, Mahalalel. I can't even pronounce the name and that's okay. Verse 18, Jared. If we count the genealogy of men from Adam through the righteous line of Seth, seven generations, we come to verse 21. When Enoch had lived, this is a different Enoch, by the way. When Enoch had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. Enoch walked with God, unlike Adam, who hid from God. Enoch walked with God after the birth of Methuselah 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Thus all the days of Enoch were 365 years. Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. What does it mean and he was not for God took him? Ah, yeah. The Jews believed that Enoch was assumed into heaven. There is an apocryphal work called the Assumption of Enoch. Enoch was taken to heaven. By tradition, he was assumed. Moses also, by tradition, was assumed into heaven. Who else was assumed into heaven? Elijah was assumed into heaven. We get that story about the bodily assumption of Moses in the epistle to Jude, where it says that there was a battle over the body of Moses between Michael and Satan. Mary was not the first person to be assumed into heaven. So I say to my Protestant brothers and sisters, If you've got a problem with the assumption of Mary, you don't have a problem with the Catholic Church. You have a problem with the Bible. You have a problem with Elijah being assumed into heaven, and Enoch being assumed into heaven, and Moses being assumed into heaven. This is why, by the way, Moses and Elijah both appear bodily with Jesus at the Transfiguration. Now, watch how important this genealogy is. We heard about Enoch, and his son was... Methuselah. In verse 25, when Methuselah lived 187 years, he became the father of Lamech. This is a different Lamech. Methuselah lived after the birth of Lamech 782 years and had other sons and daughters as all the days of Methuselah were 969 years and he died. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he became the father of a son and called his name Noah saying, out of the ground which the Lord has cursed, this one will give us relief. Reversing the curse which God had made upon the ground in Genesis chapter 3. Noah is of the righteous line of Seth. He is a great, 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 great grandson of Seth. And now we can follow the genealogy of Adam through Seth, the sons of God versus the sons of the devil. Cain and his sons go one way. They go the way of death, the way of destruction. And the people of God, the sons of God, go towards life and light to live in communion with God and glorify His name and walk with Him. Out of the ground which the Lord has cursed, this one shall give us relief from our work, from the burden which we have now received from the curse. 
in Genesis chapter 5, verse 28. Now, how many of you know the story of Noah? Wonderful, we get to skip it. If you don't know it, go read it. I'll simply tell you this, that the whole story of the flood takes place in the context or using imagery from the creation of the world. In the beginning, God separated the waters above from the waters below. Now He would bring those waters back together again in a massive flood. In the beginning, God breathed His life into mankind and into creation. Now that life breath will be taken away. In the beginning, darkness was on the face of the abyss. The rain would have been so torrential that the sun even would have been blocked out. In the beginning, the Spirit of God hovered over the abyss. And now Moses will send forth from the ark a dove to hover over those waters again. And just as in the beginning God separated those waters, again the waters would be separated and dry ground would appear. And coming now onto that dry ground, there would be a man who walked with God. The man Noah. Turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 9, verse 1. And God blessed Noah. Who else was blessed in our story? And what kind of a person did he become? A king. And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. There will be now a new head of humanity, Adam and Noah. And Noah will come out of that ark. He will offer God worship. God will give him the command to be fruitful and multiply. A covenant between the two will be formed. And in verse 20, Noah was the first tiller of the soil. And he planted a garden. What does it sound like? Genesis, huh? He planted a garden. And he drank of the wine. He ate of the fruit. And when he partook of the fruit of the garden, he became drunk. He sinned. And now that sin will redound upon his children. It is the same story repeated over and over again, not only here in the flood, but throughout the whole story of salvation history, even in our own life. It is the same story of Adam and Eve, God standing and knocking at the door and asking us to open it, and us through sin closing that door and walking away from God and receiving death as our just reward. It is the same story, and if you know that story, you know the entire Bible. You simply have to be able to apply it in each and every incident. Now, let's look at this text because it's not an easy one. It's not a text that you know well, and so we do have to stop here to build a bridge. Noah was the first tiller of the soil. He planted a vineyard, and he became drunk. I want to go back to verse 18 and show you something. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark. Noah was not alone in the ark, was he? Noah took with him his wife, his three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, and their three wives, eight in all, were saved in the flood. The sons of Noah, in verse 18, who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. Now who's Canaan? It's very strange the way the text is worded here. Because suddenly, right there, the story stops to remind us that Ham was the father of Canaan. And then it moves on. These three were the sons of Noah. Not these four. These three were the sons of Noah. And from these the whole earth was peopled. Noah was the first tiller of the soil. He planted a vineyard. He drank of the wine and he became drunk. He lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. Then his two brothers, Shem and Japheth, took a garment, laid it upon both of their shoulders. They walked backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see 
their father's nakedness. When Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Ham. Mm. Cursed be Canaan, the son of Ham. Now that doesn't seem fair, does it? Mean old God. Cursed be Canaan, a slave of slaves shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed by the Lord my God be Shem. We now have a third blessing. And when a man is blessed by his father, what does he become? The head of the family. The king of the kingdom. So what is going on here? Who is Canaan? And why is he cursed in the story? Come back to verse 22 with me. Or verse 21. And he drank of the wine and became drunk, and he lay uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father. What does it mean in biblical language to see? To know, yeah. Yeah, to know. Look, when you see something and you close your eyes, you have it within you. It's a form of knowledge. huh? And we also know that knowledge can be a symbol of something more, namely, carnal knowledge. To see the nakedness of his father. What is going on? To find out, leave your hand there in Genesis and turn with me to the book of Leviticus chapter 18. My brothers and sisters in Christ, you know the story, the epistle of St. Paul very well, to the Ephesians. And you also know the story of Genesis when it says, Adam and Eve became one flesh. And St. Paul says that marital union of one flesh, he describes it as a person, he describes it as having a head and a body. I'm sorry for my, my brother's an artist, I'm not. A head and a body. And what part is the head? The husband, according to St. Paul and according to Jewish tradition. And what part of that covenant union of marriage is the body? The wife. Leviticus chapter 18, verse 6. None of you shall approach anyone near of kin to him to uncover nakedness. I am the Lord. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father. Look, you shall not uncover the nakedness of your father. What part of you is clothed? Your body. You shall not uncover the nakedness of your father, which is the nakedness of your mother. She is your mother. You shall not uncover her nakedness. The nakedness of Noah was his body. And his body was much more than his own physical body. It was... His wife. Go back to Genesis chapter 9, right? Go back up to verse 18. The sons of Noah who went forth from the ark were Shem, Ham, Japheth. Ham was the father of Canaan. Come back down to verse 22. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father, which is his mother. He saw. He knew. I think we can leave it at that. And the result of that sin, of beholding, of knowing the nakedness of his father, was a son who was not Noah's. Cursed be Canaan. A slave of slaves shall he be to his brothers. Now why would a son do this? In the ancient Semitic culture, and we'll look at this later on in the book of Kings, to gain control of someone's family, to become the head of the kingdom, there was a way that you could do that. And it was to take the wife of the head of that kingdom and to have relations with her. And if you did that, You controlled that man's kingdom. In the genealogy, 
we hear the firstborn, always genealogy is given the firstborn and second and so forth, goes Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham was not to receive the fatherly blessing as head of the household. He would have always lived a good life, yes, but he would not have been the king of the kingdom. And there was one way, and one way only, he could take what was not his. And that was to take his father's wife. Cursed be Cain, and a slave of slaves shall he be to his brothers. He also said, Blessed by the Lord my God be Shem, and let Canaan be his slave. May God enlarge Japheth, and let him dwell in the tents of Shem, and let Canaan be his slave. After the flood, Noah lived 350 years. All the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. These are the generations of the sons of Noah. So and so begot. So and so, look at your Bible. This is the chapter you hate. Chapter 10, the entire chapter is a genealogy. This is where we completely lose it. But this genealogy is unique, and we're spending a lot of time here, I know, but it's absolutely essential because the entire story of salvation history will be a battle between the sons of Shem, the Semites, the Shemites, huh? A battle between the Semites and the Canaanites. The entire battle from here to Jesus Christ will be a battle between those two people. One who is revolting against the one who he should be serving. And the other trying to become head over the kingdom which he has been given. These are the generations of the sons of Noah. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Sons were born. The sons of Japheth, notice you would expect in a genealogy, whose genealogy would we get first? Shem's. But we don't. In this text, in this text alone in sacred scripture, we get the youngest first, and it's not down until verse 21 that the oldest comes last. The genealogies are reversed here for a reason. I told you that the Hebrew word for name is Shem. Shem was given the name by his father and by God. Ham tried to make a name for himself like Cain had done before him and like Lamech had done before him. And now we have a genealogy which is reversed. So that you have at the end of that genealogy the genealogy of Shem, the one who has the name. Verse 21. Look at chapter 11, verse 10. These are the descendants of Shem. The genealogy of Shem is repeated later on. Like two bookends. And what good Bible students do you now want to ask yourself? What story comes in between? Why would Moses reverse the genealogy so that at the bottom of the first genealogy is Shem, the one who has the name, and after this next story is the genealogy of Shem also. What story falls in between? Chapter 11, verse 4, Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top to the heavens, and let us make a Shem for ourselves. And who are these people in the story of the Tower of Babel? Take a look up just at verse 2. And as men migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar. And they settled there. And it was there now that the story of the Tower of Babel will be told. A people who are living in the land of Shinar. And who are the people who are living in the land of Shinar? Look back at chapter 10, verse 6. In that genealogy that we always skip. And the sons of Ham were Cush, Egypt, Put, and Canaan. It sounds like a a list of enemies, doesn't it, huh? All of those people that will now be an enemy to Shem and his descendants are here listed. The sons of Cush and so forth. Look at verse 9. 
He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Therefore, it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. Erech and Akkad, all of them in the land of Shinar. The people who tried to build themselves a name were none other than the descendants of Ham. Hmm? Trying to make a name for themselves instead of trying to make a name for God. And at both sides of that story of these people who are trying to make a name for themselves, we have the genealogy of the people who have received their name from God. The descendants of Shem. Does that make sense? Okay. Here's our next fundamental point. Verse 10. These are the descendants of Shem. Now look, you guys would have skipped that story, right? You would have skipped the genealogy. Never skip a genealogy. It's there for a reason. You just have to know how to read it and to follow it and to listen to it and to find out who the people are. Okay? Look at verse 10. These are the descendants of Shem. When Shem was a hundred years old, he became the father of Arpachshad. Ay, oh, Lord have mercy. Our pocket shot. Anyways, I'm not going to read these names, but I want you to look with me as we scan down the genealogy. Verse 12, verse 15, we have Shelah. Verse 16, we have Eber. Verse 18, we have Peleg. What genealogy is this, friends? Whose genealogy? Shem's genealogy. The sons of God. We're going to keep reading now. Verse 20, verse 22, Sirug. Verse 23, Sirug lived and his son was Nahor. Verse 24, when Nahor had lived 29 years, he became the father of Terah. And Nahor lived after the birth of Terah 190 years and had other sons and daughters. When Terah had lived 70 years, he became the father of Abraham. Abram, he hadn't had his name changed yet. Abraham is the rightful descendant of the throne of Shem. And Shem is the rightful descendant of the throne of Noah. And Noah is the rightful descendant of the throne of Enoch. And Enoch is the rightful descendant of the throne of Seth. And Seth is the rightful descendant of the throne of Adam who is made in the image and likeness of God. Can you do that with me? <laughs> Why not? Let's do it. Right now. Shout them out. Who's the first major figure? Adam. Who's next? Seth. Seth. Who's the next major figure you need to know? Enoch. Enoch. Who's the next major figure? Noah. Noah. Who comes next? Shem. Who comes next? Abraham. Who's Abraham's son? Isaac. Isaac. Who's Isaac's son? Jacob. Jacob becomes Israel and he will die in Egypt in exile. You now know the story from the Garden of Eden to the land of Egypt and to the story of Moses. You know every major event, how they're related, who the enemies are, who the sons of God are, who the sons of the devil are, what the sons of the devil are trying to do, make a name for themselves, and what the sons of God are trying to do, make a name for God. Is that helpful so far? I hope so. Yes? Could we make a list of the bad guys from being there? Yeah. No, because the bad guys are to be wiped out from the book of life. You don't need to know who they are except for a few basic figures. You need to know who came. You, I won't tell you what party they're running in. See, I was in L.A., okay, giving this conference, and I tried to joke like that, and I was booed, okay? Ah, uh, I love Virginia. I told them, I said, who would ever leave Monterey, California to move to Virginia? I said... I moved out of California when Jesus moved out of California. 
Uh, all right, now. Adam, Seth, Enoch, Noah, Shem, Abraham. Beautiful. Okay, hold on now. Hold on. We don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves. Because now we have a man, Abraham, who is going to be called into a covenant relationship with God. And now we're going to put a final piece in our puzzle, which is so important for your understanding of the story of salvation history. And it has to do with that map that you have with you. Chapter 11, verse 27. Now these are the descendants of Terah. Terah was the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. And Haran was the father of Lot. Haran died before his father Terah in the land of his birth in Ur of the Chaldeans. And Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarah, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, and the daughters of Haran, the father of Milcah, and Iscah. Now Sarah was barren, and she had no children. Terah took Abram, his son, Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarah, his daughter-in-law, his son Abraham's wife, and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. Chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Who is this man, Abram? He is the descendant of? Thank you. Shem. And I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you, and all of the families of the earth shall be blessed. Verse 7. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your descendants I will give this land. What happens when you give a piece of land to descendants? It is called an an inheritance. Abraham is receiving a land. The land of the Canaanites. And he's receiving it as an inheritance. Turn your Bibles back to chapter 9, verse 24, when Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his youngest or little son is a better translation, not his youngest, his little son had done to him, he said, Cursed be Canaan, a slave of slaves shall he be to his brother. Cursed be Canaan, a slave of slaves he shall be to his brother. Have you ever known a slave to own land? No, neither have I. And Abram, the rightful inheritor of the throne of Shem, whose slave the Canaanites are supposed to be, is going to be given a land in which the slaves have taken control a land which they have taken, which was not theirs to take. Abram is going to receive this land as an inheritance. And he comes to meet, in chapter 14, a very important figure. The intervening chapters, there's a civil war among the sons of Ham. They're all warring over this land called the Canaanites. There's a huge civil war taking place right at the bottom of what is now the Dead Sea. Massive civil war. Abraham is there. He gets involved in the war. He beats the guys, his enemies, in the battle. And he comes back with the spoils of that battle. And he meets a very special man in chapter 14, verse 17. After his return from the defeat of Shedulam Laomer, and the kings who were with him, the kings of Sodom, went out to meet him in the valley of Sheva, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. He was a priest of God Most High. And he blessed and said, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, maker of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High who has delivered your enemies into your hand. Melchizedek, the king 
of Salem. Where is Salem? Ah, Salem is the ancient title for the city of Jerusalem. We won't turn there just for time, but you can write down in your notes Psalm 76, verse 2. Abram is called from Ur of the Chaldees. And we have to go back and get one more tool for our tool belt. you got to go all the way back with me for a second. Back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 24. At the casting out of Adam and Eve. He drove man out of the garden, and at the east of the garden he placed a cherub with a flaming sword. In which direction were Adam and Eve cast out? Toward the east. And on the east side of the Garden of Eden, he placed the angel so that man could not enter back in. Does that make sense? Turn your page just a little bit to verse 16. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord. This is after he killed his brother. And dwelt in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Man was being exiled in the direction of the east, away from paradise, away from the household of God, away from the Garden of Eden, away from the land which Adam and Eve had received as their home. East, east, east of Eden. And I want you to pull out your map. I want you to look at your map. And I want you to come. You see Persian Gulf? Come Right up, just north and west, and you will see Ur of the Chaldeans, where Abram was called from. If we draw a line in the exact opposite direction from exile, the exact opposite direction would be west. If you draw a line from Ur of the Chaldeans, what great city do you encounter? Jerusalem. And who is dwelling there as king? Melchizedek. And surrounding Melchizedek, that king of God most high, are a people who are meant to be slaves. Who were the Canaanites supposed to be serving? Shem. Not owning land. Not warring with each other over whose land they should control. They should be serving the king of the head of the household of God. But like their fathers before them, they were trying to make a name for themselves. We find a people who are meant to be slave of slaves in revolt to a king. And from that place of exile from God, God calls a man who is the rightful inheritor to the throne of God, and he calls him to a throne city and says, you will receive this land as your inheritance, your rightful inheritance. How unjust would it have been for God to say, you go take the land of the Canaanites. Doesn't that sound a little unfair? Unless you realize who the Canaanites are and what they're doing, and who Abraham is, and what he's to be doing. Who is to be the household, the head of the household, that the Canaanites should be serving? Abraham. And Abraham is taken by God to the throne city of Jerusalem, in the center of the kingdom, which is now in revolt. And in that city, he meets a king. And that king does what only a father can do. Chapter 14, verse 19. And Melchizedek blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram. Who else has been blessed in our story? Adam has been blessed. Noah has been blessed. Shem has been blessed. And now there is a king giving a father's blessing, a blessing which only a father can give to a son. The Jewish tradition is that Melchizedek 
is none other than Shem. Melchizedek, the name Melchizedek, is the joining of two Hebrew words, Melech and Zedek. Melech is king, and Zedek is righteousness. The king of righteousness. Melchizedek is not his first name, it's his throne title. He is the king of righteousness. He is the king of the sons of God in contrast to the king of the sons of the devil. The Jewish tradition and the early Christian tradition was that Melchizedek was Shem. And if you read carefully the years that Shem lived, yes, he was alive at this time. In fact, he was in his final years when his great, 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 great grandson was called by God out of exile to take back the land which he was to have as an inheritance. And that land, Jerusalem, the Holy Land, was believed by the Jews to be none other than the physical location of the Garden of Eden, from which man had been cast toward the east and was now being called directly west back to. Why was east the direction of exile? What would have happened if they were exiled to the west? Yeah, you would hit the, they would have drowned. They would have drowned. And notice also what that sea is called. The Mediterranean. Huh? The middle of the earth. Notice, what's the J.R. Tolkien thing about? Middle Earth. Huh? He knew what he was talking about. The middle of the earth. The beginning of creation. The place of the household of God. The Garden of Eden. And now, the sons of God are going to receive it back as an inheritance. And do you think that the sons of the devil are going to lie down and give it back to them? Hell no. The rest of the Old Testament will be a battle between the sons of God and the descendants of Abraham, the Semites, the Hebrew people, and the people that want to refuse to give them what is theirs as a rightful inheritance. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, we have very little time left, and I have to get through the rest of the book of Genesis. So, here's what we're going to do. We have all of our tools now, my friends. Let me tell you right now, you know the story of salvation history. All I have to do is put a couple more events, really two events. I'll do it for you right now. The next exile which will take place will be down to Egypt. And they will be called back and led by Moses back to their land of inheritance. And then they will be cast out to Babylon and they will be brought back from Babylon to restore Jerusalem. That's it. And then Jesus comes. Yeah. That's the whole Old Testament. I'm not kidding you. That's it. And everything else are the bridges in between that we now have to build for ourselves. Now, you know the rest of the book of Genesis because who is the son of Abraham? Isaac. And if you don't know the story of Isaac, my dear friends, guess what? Turn off CNN and go read it this week. Okay? And whose wife is Isaac? Rebecca, in Genesis chapter 24. You can read about that if you want. And in Genesis chapter 27, Rebecca has two sons. It's extremely important because we're talking now just about the family of God, the sons of God. The people who are born to this family are extremely important. Rebecca has two sons, twins. And they come out one before the other, don't they? What are their names? Esau Esau and Jacob. And who is the firstborn son? Esau. Esau. And who ends up becoming the head of the household? Jacob. Esau, you know the story well, was very hungry one day. And he sold his birthright to his younger brother. He traded his kingship, and you got to say, how stupid is that? He traded his place as head of the family to his brother. 
and his brother, not being the best of all men, snuck in and snuck the blessing from his father. At whose instigation? Yeah, their mother. Their mother had a preference for the younger son and told his son, go in, go in there, sneak into your father's bedroom. He's blind, he's deaf, he won't know what's going on and let him lay his hands on you so that you can get the blessing and become the head of the household. She wanted to make her favorite son the head of the household so she could be with him and keep him near her all her life. But she sinned, and she was deceitful. And what happened? Soon after that blessing in chapter 27, you'll see verse 41, Now Esau hated Jacob because of the blessing with which his father had blessed him. And Esau said to himself, The days of mourning for my father are approaching. Then I will kill my brother. And what happens? Jacob flees. And for the rest of the life of his mother, she will lose the son who she had deceitfully tried to keep. He leaves and goes and finds his wife. And you know that story well too. He goes and serves for how many years for his wife? Seven years after completing a full service to receive his bride, he is tricked by his uncle and ends up with the one he didn't want. Right? And so he ends up marrying two women and their names are? Leah Leah and Rachel. Now, before we look at that, you got to look at Genesis chapter 32. Finally, Jacob makes his way back out of exile, right? He had to leave the Holy Land. He had to leave the place where God wanted him to be. He fled out and he gets married. He receives two wives and then he comes back and his brother comes to meet him. And he's afraid that his brother's going to kill him. He sends forth all of his flocks and all of his children and all of his servants out in front of him to appease his brother. And he goes to sleep. Chapter 32, verse 22. The same night he arose and took his two wives, his two maids and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of Jabbok. He took them and sent them across the stream, and likewise everything that he had. And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. Look at verse 30. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life is preserved. He met an angel there on his way back to paradise. What did God place at the edge of paradise when he cast Adam and Eve out? Thank you. He makes his way back. He meets an angel. And at that location, at that spot, God changes his name from Jacob to Israel. And Israel will have how many sons? And if you say you don't know this story, you got one week, it's right there. No excuse. Read about his 12 sons who will now become the kingdom of Israel. Okay, now, we're a little behind. I wanted to get a little bit further, but that's okay. Here's what I want you to do for your homework. I want you to read the story of those 12 sons, the story of Joseph. You can read from chapter 34 all the way to the end of Genesis, chapter 50. It's not very many pages. You already know the story well, but what I want you to pay attention to is who receives the blessing. Which son of Israel? Yeah. Joseph does not receive the blessing. He is one of his father's favorite sons, but he does not receive the blessing to become head of the household. And you know why it's so important that we know who the head of the household is going to be? Because through that man, God will bring about the salvation of the world. Through that man, the sons of God will become righteous and reign upon the earth all the way until the day when the rightful heir to the son of Adam and Eve comes to be born of the mother of God. It's absolutely essential that you know which son receives the blessing. 
We'll pick up the story there. So before you leave, tell me. The first person? Adam. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh-huh. Who is? Melchizedek. Yeah? Abram. Isaac. Jacob. Who has? Twelve sons. It's kind of exciting, isn't it? Because you already know what's going to happen in the Exodus now, right? You already know how Joseph is going to relate to Noah and how Shem is going to relate to Seth and how the story of creation relates to the story of the flood and how the story of the flood relates to the Exodus story. And next week when we pick this up, we're going to take those 12 sons and we're going to walk ourselves quickly into Egypt because they end up following their brother. Their brother ends up being sold into Egypt out of jealousy, right? And sin oftentimes follows us, doesn't it, friends? And what we do will oftentimes take root in our own life. They sell their brother into slavery, and what ends up happening to them and their children? They end up in slavery in Egypt too. We're going to quickly walk into Egypt. We're going to grab the hand of Moses, and we're going to march right out Because God does not want His people exiled from the Garden of Eden where He will feed His people with life. Where they can eat and they can live forever. Next week, we're going to walk from Joseph. And I promise I will not go slow next week. We're going to go all the way up. We're going to get at least to King David and the Davidic Kingdom. So that the third week, we can go from the Davidic Kingdom to Jesus Christ. Okay? I'm going to take a few questions later. God bless you. I'll see you next week. Okay. I'm going to take one question out of the running. Only because I don't know enough to answer it. The question of close relation. huh? Brothers marrying sisters and so forth. I'll simply say this. There is a biological scientific answer... The reason why the church does not allow marriage of close relation is because of what it produces. Okay? That problem was not a problem in the beginning when you had the first generation of a clean gene pool. Okay? I'm leaving it at that, and I'm going to ask my brother, who has his background in science and his degree in scripture to write a short little answer for our website to give you the scientific background, which I cannot give you. Well, as I'm saying, is the reason why the church does not allow for marriage of close relation is because of the result of that relation, not because of the relation itself. Does that make sense? Do you want to go over the rules? Just make sure it's a question I can answer. Go ahead. <laughs> You mentioned the uh, genealogy of Shem and then uh, Ham. What about Japheth? Yeah, the tradition is that Japheth headed north on the Mediterranean and ended up becoming the the European and Northern European peoples. I mean, it's somewhat of a guess, but that's the theory that he headed north. How do you reconcile the... Oh, no. um, Sorry. (laughs) The script... um, Chapter 2 in Genesis, where it has a very clear description on the location of Eden in relation to the Tigris and Euphrates Uh, with the location in Jerusalem. Okay, there's no good answer, except all of this stuff, we're left with a partial story. And so we have to say, well, much written here is symbolic. And the church does not require you to take this text, in fact, you're not supposed to take this literalistically. A literalistic interpretation would say that there are exactly seven 24-hour days and misses the entire point that the story is at something bigger than that. Nor does it say that you can't take a literal seven-day interpretation. Augustine, for example, said this is symbolic of seven epochs, seven large time periods. But that's not your question, is it? What about these rivers? One theory I have heard, which I think is a reasonable theory, if you're going to take this text, not in a literalistic, but in a literal point of view, if you want to try to hold on to the story itself, is that at the time of the flood, as normally happens in a flood, the ways of the rivers were changed. 
and the sources of the rivers were changed. I mean, we see this in New York, where the landscape is literally altered. Well, the Great Flood would have altered the landscape even more so. So now we have rivers which are not parting from one source, as it's describing here in Genesis, but coming from the north and the south and whatever, something like that. I'll see if I can post something, maybe a little map that describes that issue on our website. I have something that deals with that. Yes? About the birthright okay. argument between Jacob and Esau, it's clear prior to that to whom the birthright actually belongs and who is stealing it. But between Jacob and Esau, who does it really belong to? Yeah, well, it belongs to Esau, right? He's born first with his brother hanging onto his ankle, right? And, and he's, he's literally fighting him coming out of the womb. But take a look, open your Bible to um, chapter 25, verse 29. Once when Jacob was boiling pottage, and these are lentils, by the way. If you ever come to our church for um, our annual trip for Vespers during Great Lent, you'll have lentils. Esau came in from the field, and he was famished. And he said to Jacob, Let me eat some of that red pottage, for I am famished. And therefore his name was called Edom. Jacob said, First, sell me your birthright. And Esau said, I'm about to die. What is youth is my birthright. And Jacob said, Swear it to me first. And he swore it to him, and he sold his birthright. Now, it was after that, that when it was time for the blessing to come, that Jacob was deceitful in how he got it. But Esau had turned it over to him. And so, there's sin on all sides here. Esau doing what he did, his brother doing what he did, his mother doing what she did. It's bad all around. So. It seems like he's supposed to get it. Why? Because that's where the line. Well, yeah, you're looking at it in hindsight. You're saying, well, yeah, I mean, he's our father in the faith. But yeah, like from God's perspective, it's right. like Jacob is supposed to get it. Well, I mean, certainly there are the ways of God which are uh, beyond us. I'll give you an example. I live in a very biblical family. And uh, my older brother, who has a much better education and much better prepared than I am, started speaking with the bishop about possible ordination to the diaconate, I ended up being ordained a deacon, and he has not been ordained a deacon yet. He's a subdeacon. I outrank my brother. Okay. <laughs> Which I rub in his face all the time. And uh, anyways, he sells his birthright. It's what happens. And we look at it now, and you say, well, yeah, of course, Jacob's supposed to be the inheritor, because he becomes the father of the 12 tribes, right? But looking at it from this direction, you realize that there was some problems and deceit in there also. But God will always write straight out of crooked lines. He will always take our sins and make them work for the salvation of God. And so throughout the story, we're going to see sinners become essential to the story of salvation. And oftentimes what will have to happen is that person will have to undergo a conversion. That's exactly what takes place, and we don't have time to get into it. The beautiful story of Jacob wrestling with the angel. It's his moment of conversion. He's exiled. He lives for how many years away from his family, away from his brother. He repents. He's sorry for what he's done. He comes back, and he's, and he's begging forgiveness of his brother. He's putting all of his livelihood out in front of him, unguarded to his brother, asking for forgiveness. And it's at that moment at the edge of paradise, that he enters into a dream. He has a, this vision. He has his little come to Jesus moment, and he faces the angel at the edge of paradise, and he struggles and undergoes that conversion, right? And his name is changed, always this change of identity. And now, once that happens, he can enter back into the family of God. And now God can really use him. Up to that point, he was of no use out in the desert. But now, back in paradise, God will use him. Yes, Kathy. It went along with what she said, but my question was, um, you know, Ham was punished because he tried to make a name for himself. There's a couple yeah. instances. Well, that's exactly what Jacob did. He tried to make a name for himself by taking his brother's blessing, yeah. yet he wasn't punished. Yeah, I mean, yes, yes, and his brother wasn't too good either. I'll just leave it at that. There's not, I'm not saying there's a good answer here. We've got two brothers that are both a problem. And God 
is able to bring about salvation through this problem. And he also repented. We have, may God grant us so many years to repent. When we were talking about Cain all the way down to Lamech, yeah. only then afterward does it go into Seth. Is there a reason they put Seth after that? Yeah, he's the third son. But it goes seven generations first from Cain. I'm not sure this is the way you want me to answer it, but this is the way I'm going to answer it. Is that you cannot read Genesis like the New York Times. It's a piece of art. And you have to see it. The thing I was talking about, Shem and Shem and Babel, right? Making a name for yourself. You literally have to see it on the page. It's not meant to be read like we read normally. Right? In fact after fact after fact after fact. He's painting a picture. It's a beautiful picture. And so he, that is the same point. God allows this whole picture to be painted. He says, you want to know what happens when men like Cain do what they do? Here's your answer. He doesn't want to get that confused. Now I'm going to tell you what happens when people like Seth do what they do. And here's your answer. It's Enoch, and he's assumed into heaven. You know, why is that genealogy put there? Right in the most critical spot, right? It's right after the fall. You're in the heart of the battle, the meat of the story, and all of a sudden, a stupid genealogy? It's this way that God puts us on a freeway to see the end result immediately. Don't forget about what's going on. Here's the meaning of the story. Don't lose sight of it. And I, and I, I said this before, but we're going to watch that now. These two lines now marching toward their end. Their end, one end being heaven and one end being hell. And those that align themselves with the sons of the devil are going to be separated from the house of God. And those that align themselves with the household of God will be saved. And this is coming back to something earlier that I was saying about God even using our sinful ways. We are going to see some very sinful people become essential figures in the story of the household of God. is God can even bring salvation out of sin. Okay, he does not abandon us, even in the worst place. And it's not the only time we're going to see major sexual problems going on. It's going to happen right here, the next person in our story. The person who receives the blessing among the twelve sons has got some serious issues on his hands. Okay? Maybe I'm getting ahead because of the issues, but Jacob had two wives, two concubines, a bunch of children... He becomes Israel, and there are 12 sons. By whom, and what about yeah, the rest getting, of the riffraff? Yeah, 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 you're getting ahead, and that's where I want you to read, because you're going to have 12 sons. The oldest son is not going to receive the family blessing. And there's a reason why he's not going to receive the family blessing. It has everything to do with what Ham did to his father. Okay, you think the story's over? It's not over. Okay, the oldest son of the 12 sons is going to lose his place in the family of God. Like Ham tried to get it, this guy's going to lose it. And stupidly, because he was the eldest son. And then he goes and does something really boneheaded. Okay? And so he's going to lose that, and another one of the sons is going to become the head of the household. Just be patient and read. Read. God bless you. We'll see you on Thursday for uh, Professor Wunsch. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist. Pray for us.